Section 9 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. Earth the Marauder. Part 2 of a three part novel. By Arthur J. Burks. What has gone before? The Earth was dying. Ever since Sarka, the first king of scientists, had given mankind the secret of life, which prolonged life indefinitely, the earthlings had multiplied beyond all count, and been forced to burrow deep into the ground and high into the air in the desperate search for the mere room in which to live. There was much civil war. The plight of the children of men was desperate. Something had to be done. Then Sarka the Third called the spokesmen of the gens of Earth around him, and proposed to them a new scheme which had come to him in his laboratory atop the Himalayas. He would swing the Earth from its orbit, send it careening through space toward the moon, there to destroy its inhabitants and supplant them with a colony of Earthlings, and then they would search into Mars. One by one the twelve spokesmen, each the head and representative of the teeming trillions comprising his gens, acceded. Even Dalis, the jealous rival of Sarka, finally gave his sulky consent. So, under Sarka's commands, the Earth's hordes were mobilized, and in tune with the master barrel in Sarka's laboratory, all the barrels of the Earth vibrated, freeing the Earth from her age-old orbit and swinging her out towards the moon. The gens of Dalis, the trillions of people who swore allegiance to him, would lead the attack on the moon. When within fifty thousand miles they darted out, clad only in their tight green clothing and the helmets that held the anti-gravitational ovoids which neutralized gravity for them and enabled them to instantly fly where they willed. The only weapons were hand atom disintegrators, and out from the moon came mysterious air cars with long clutching tentacles, the weapons of the moon's minions. The war of the worlds was begun. Yet Dalis, leader of the gens that now engaged the moon's air cars, was still in the laboratory with Sarka. For Dalis' treacherous mind coveted control of the earth, and though the urge to lead his gens into a battle was tremendous, still he stayed, watching Sarka closely waiting for the moment when he could trick Sarka and assume control. And at the head of the gens of Dalis was a woman, Jaska, whom Sarka loved. The moon's air car swept away the gens of Dalis, and out from Earth pulled the gens of Cleric, who was Jaska's father. The newcomers fought desperately to save Jaska from the deadly clutches of the air cars. Dalis could stand it no longer. He sped forth from the laboratory to reorganize his beaten gens. Jaska flew for home, but behind her a single air car, splashed with crimson, reached forth its tentacles to clutch her, and Sarka groaned with the agony of his impotence to help the woman he loved. Chapter 11 Escape and Daily Laughter But Sarka wasn't to be so easily beaten. There still remained an infinite number of possible changes of speed by manipulation of overdone by vibrations set up by the barrels, without which this flight from the beginning would have been impossible. But for two hours, while the wild-robed man of Cleric fought against the car of the Crimson Splashes to prevent the capture of the daughter of their spokesman, and died by hundreds in the grip of those grim tentacles, Sarka was forced to labor with the barrels until perspiration bathed his whole body, and his heart was heavy as he foresaw failure. And failure meant death or worse for Jaska. But at the end of two hours, while the men of Cleric fought like men inspired against the air car of the crimson splashes, a cessation in the outward speed of the earth could be noted. At the end of three hours the body of Jaska, all this time fighting manfully to attain to landing place on the earth, was at last bulking larger. But the tentacles of the air car were groping after her, reaching for her, striving to catch and clasp her to her death. The two Sarkas watched and prayed, 
while the might of the barrels, traveling at top speed, fought against the force of whatever was used to by the moon man to compel the moon to withdraw. Still the men of Cleric fought that single car, and died by hundreds in the fighting. White-robed figures, which became shriveled and black in the grip of those tentacles. Countless of the men of Cleric deliberately cast themselves against those tentacles, throwing their lives away to give Jaska more leeway in her race for life. "'Will she make it, father?' queried Sarka in a whisper. "'If the courage and loyalty of her people stand for anything, she will make it,' he replied. On she came at top speed, and now through the microtelescopes the Sarkas could see the agony of effort on her face. Even through the smooth mask used by the people of Earth for flight in space where there was no atmosphere, courage was there, and the will of never say die. And Jaska, moreover, was coming back to the man she loved. In a nebulous sort of way Sarka realized this, for though these two hadn't made it, there was a resonant inner sympathy between them which had rounded into an emotion of overpowering force since Jaska had proved to Sarka that she was to be trusted, that he had been something less than a faithful lover when he had mistrusted her ever so little. Closer now and closer, and at last the air car of the crimson splashes was drawn away, losing in the race for life. It was falling back, as though minded to turn about and race back for the moon, now a ball in the sky, far away the outlines of its craters growing dim and misty with distance. Now the men of Cleric, those who remained, were breaking contact with the air car, and forming a valiant rear guard for the retreat of Jaska. Throughout the Earth, as the barrels fought with ever-increasing speed to lower the rate of the Earth's outward rays from the moon, was such a trembling, such a vibration induced by conflicting alien forces, as there hadn't been even in that moment when back there in its orbit, the Earth could have either been kept within its orbit or hurled outward into space at the touch of a finger. Now Jaska, surrounded by her father's man, was almost close enough to touch the Earth. She made it, weak and weary, and rested for a moment while her father's man steadied her. Then, thrusting them aside, the gestures bidding them return to their chance, she lifted into the air again and fled straight for the laboratory of Sarga. She entered tiredly through the exit dome, and all but collapsed into the arms of Sarka. Gently he removed her helmet of the anti-gravitational ovoid, noting as she leaned against him the tumultuous beating of her heart. Then her gentle eyes opened, and she whispered to Sarka. You trust me now. For answer he bent and kissed her softly on the lips. For the kiss from the far distant time when the first baby was kissed by the first mother had been the favorite caress of mankind. Her face was transfigured as she read his answer in his eyes and the touch of his lips. Then, remembering, fear flashed across her face. She straightened and, grasping Sarka by the hand, hurried with him into the observatory. She took the seat in which Dalis had sat before he had gone out to the command of his gens, studied for many minutes the battle in space between the two alien worlds. Dalis is winning, said the elder Sarka quietly, apparently. The qualification is a just one, said Jaska softly. Apparently, indeed. You will note now that though men of the gens of Dalis swarm all about the air cars and even clamber atop them, no more dying in the grasp of those tentacles. Is Dalis arranging a treacherous truce with the moon man? I've been wondering about that, said Sarka softly, for it's my belief that nothing not conductive to his own selfish interests would have forced Dalis to leave this place and take command of his gens, as I had first ordered, unless he had schemes planned of which father and I could know nothing. Now that I think of it, Jaska, how did Dalis know our secret code of fingers? Jaska started and turned and blanched face to Sarka. Did he know? she cried. Did he? If he did, that proves a suspicion that I have entertained since the first moment when Dalis swept in the fight, 
and I sent that alien signals were being flashed back and forth. Flashed back and forth? ejaculated Sarka. How do you mean? The Dalis was somehow able to communicate with the Moon Men in their own language, or through their own signals. Why not? He knew our secret code, did he not? I never gave it to him, and I know that you didn't. No, Dalis has some means, never discovered or suspected by you, Sarkas, whereby he is able to understand alien tongues and alien sign manuals. That means, said Sarka the Elder in a dead voice, that by forcing Dalis to go out at the head of his gens, we have, interrupted Sarka the Younger, placed a new weapon of treason in his hands. Dalis, at the very moment of contact with the aircars loaded with moon men, broke in on their signals. They must have had some means of signaling one another, and communicated with them in their own way. Do you think it possible that, with all his gens, he may go over to the moon men from an alliance with them? For many moments no one dared to answer the question. Yet from what the Sarkas knew of him, it wasn't impossible at all. For Dalis was the master goatist always, and never overlooked opportunity to gain something for himself. It was Jaska who broke the silence. Did you not carefully, she said, those aircars, which were partially destroyed by our ray directors and atom disintegrators? The Sarkas nodded. Did you know that no man, formed like our own, no creatures of any sort whatever fell from the cars? Again the awesome silence, and the keen brains of the Sarkas wrestled with this vague hint of the uncanny. You mean, Jaska, you mean that the occupants of air cars are part of the cars, but beings of the moon? That they are either metal monsters endowed with brains, or tiny creatures irrevocably attached to the cars themselves. But how, said Sarka at last, are we to be sure? I can't understand what Dalis might do if the moon man granted his wish for an alliance with them. It's easy to understand why his gens would follow his lead, for with the moon forced outward from the earth faster than his gens could retreat, there is but one direction for his gens to go, toward the moon. They would go to the moon as captives and trust the keen brain of Dalis to gain the mastery, sooner or later, of the moon man. And then... And then, repeated Sarko the Elder, then Dalis has already been inspired by the speed with which those air cars travel. You will remember that he didn't take kindly to leaving the Earth and making his abode on some other planet. But why could he not do so? Combine forces and knowledge with the people of that planet, and then return to Earth in alliance with them. After we have depleted our forces by placing a large portion of our people on Mars and Venus and Saturn. Sarka, my son, said Sarka's father, before we continue with our flight to Mars, we must know the truth. We must somehow learn exactly what is going on on the moon. If you could reach the moon alone, undetected, and bring back a report. For a moment he left it there and the faces of all three were gray with worry and abysmal fear. I can't go bodily, father, said Sarka at last, but you remember my secret exit dome to the right of the observatory, from which I have never yet dared exit from this place for fear that it might cost me my life. Sarka the elder nodded, while Jaska looked puzzled. Another evidence of the fact that Sarka hadn't always trusted her for she knew nothing of a secret exit dome. Sarka's eyes, as he looked at Jaska, mutely asked her forgiveness, which she gave him with her smile. I remember, son, and now... Surely it's worth risking one's life to know what new menace looms over the children of men. What is the use of this secret dome? asked Jaska softly. It's merely an elaboration of the regular exit dome combined with certain phases of our atom disintegrators and the principle involved in the anti-gravitational ovoids. I step into the secret exit dome, guard for flight outside, and will myself to appear bodily in a certain place. 
It is instantaneous. I step into the dome, for example, and will myself to appear all upon the moon, and there I will appear. You mean that during the period of transposition you are invisible? Yes, invisible because not existent, except for the essential elements of me, broken down by the secret exit dome, reassembled at the place willed in their entirety. I can't fly there, for a million eyes would see me approach. I must go in secret, as a spy, and wearing the clothing and insignia of a member of the gens of Dalis. Silence in the observatory for a brief breathing space, and then Jaska spoke that speech out of the books of antiquity, which remains the classic expression of loyalty. Whithersoever thou goest, there will I go also. From the laboratory came a sudden burst of laughter, the laughter which all three recognized as the laughter of Dalis. But when they entered the place of the revolving barrel, there was no one there, and a feeling of dread, all-encompassing, held them thrilled for the space of several heartbeats. Dalis, they knew, was thousands of miles away, upon the moon, yet here in the place of the master barrel they all three had just heard his sardonic laughter. Chapter 12 Ashes of the Moon Through the micro-telescopes it was possible to see what had happened after Dalis had assumed command of the gens of Dalis. For even though the moon, in spite of the speed of the barrels, was being forced further and further from the earth, the eyes of the micro-telescopes peeked out and enlarged details to such an extent that the battle seemed to be transpiring under the eyes of the beholders. A terrific jumble, in which earthlings and aircars were all tumbled together in mad chaos, a great mass of writhing, green-garbed figures, infinite in number, in the midst of which were the gigantic aircars, like monster beetles being beset by armies upon armies of ants. Then, by the time Jaska had seated herself in the observatory atop the Himalayas to watch what developed, the battle seemed to be over and the moon man had won, for the huge car swung around between the myriads of the gens of Dalis, and seemed to be herding them toward the moon, as though they were prisoners. Telepathically, Sarka and his father had been able to catch some hint of the thoughts of the earthlings in the battle, and these thoughts had been tinged with doubt, fear, and horror, so that even thus to receive them, by mental telepathy, was to feel the searing heat of their fear. Now, in the instant when the battle in space seemed to be over and the gens of Dalis were prisoners, the thought waves were no more, and a brooding silence took their place. Dalis, the Sarkas knew, possessed the power to mask his thoughts, for it was a power possessed in common by all the scientists of Earth. But the common people of his gens didn't possess that power. However, for the moment Sarka had forgotten an all-important something that when people were outside the roof of the world, they were subservient to the will of a common commander to whom they had sworn allegiance. If, therefore, Dalis could mask his own thoughts from the brains of men, he could also mask the thoughts of the people of his gens, merely by willing it. So Sarka and his father and Jaska couldn't know whether the gens of Dalis had gone over in a body with him, in a truce with the people of the moon, or whether they were dual prisoners, of Dalis and of the moon man. More than ever was it necessary for someone to somehow reach the moon and make a thorough investigation, discover just what Dalis was doing, what mischief he was hatching. The secret exit dome seemed to be the answer. You can manage without me, father? asked Sarka. The elder Sarka nodded. Of the other spokesmen of Earth, went on Sarka, I trust Gerd the most. Might I suggest that you bring him here, trust him in all details, and let him take my place wherever possible? Or, better still, keep Jaska here with you. I... I may not be able to return. I'll try to find a way but we can always communicate telepathically, Jaska. Jaska, said that young lady grimly, goes with Sarka wherever Sarka goes. But it may mean death. We can only guess at the cunning of the moon-dwellers. 
They may have been in secret communication with Dalis for centuries. Dalis, who somehow discovered our secret finger cord, may also know of the secret exit dome and the principle upon which it operates. If he does, he may know how to combat it. Perhaps that explains his laughter. Perhaps he heard and understood every word we spoke. Hears and understands every word we speak now. Who knows? He may wait until I have passed through the secret exit dome and then make it impossible for me to be reincarnated on the moon or elsewhere. No matter, said Jaska softly. Wherever Sarka goes, there goes Jaska. It's useless to attempt to dissuade me. And it's time you learned that. In spite of himself, Sarka smiled, and his father met his smile with a quizzical one of his own. Both men had the same thought. The eternal woman, said Sarka the elder, no man has ever understood her, no man ever will, and all men are ruled by her. Sarka shrugged, and Jaska spoke again. Don't you think it's time we tried this new experiment? Sarka nodded, and his face was suddenly allied with the excitement which burned within him. First, he said, we need a countryman's of the gens of Dalis for two people. Jaska smiled. Foreseeing that we might have need of such equipment, I had several complete outfits sent here when I took charge of the gens of Dalis as its spokesman. Two minutes later, arrayed in the green clothing of the house of Dalis, swathed in it from neck to toe, wearing their bells and the masks, which was necessary to life in space where there was no atmosphere, the whole topped by the gleaming helmets whose skull pans held the infinitesimally small anti-gravitational ovoids, Jaska and Sarka entered the secret exit dome side by side. On the breast and back of each showed the yellow stars of the gens of Dalis. There was no hiding their identity otherwise, and if any of the gens saw them, both would be immediately recognized. For Jaska had commanded the gens, and Sarka was the world's greatest scientist known to every human being. But they planned on carrying out their investigations by stealth. Father, said Sarka, when the inner door is closed upon us, you have but to press the button to the right of the door. Press it when the light beside it glows red, which will indicate that we have willed ourselves to go to a certain destination. The inner door closed upon Sarka and Jaska, and, hand in hand, side by side, their bodies glowing with knowledge of warm, sympathetic contact, they waited for a miracle which had never before been attempted. Are you afraid, beloved? queried Sarka. When I am with you, she said softly, I have no fear. Then face the outer door and will to go wherever I will to take you. Side by side, hand in hand still, they faced the outer door and Sarka wheeled. Let us appear together in a deserted spot within sight but unseen of the moon crater from which those aircars were sent against us. A sudden blur, the cessation of all knowledge. And then, Sarka and Jaska stood side by side in a desolate expanse surrounded by bleak and appalling mountains of grotesque shape, in a light that was weirdly, awesomely blue. Their feet were invisible, deeply rooted in some soft, fine material which looked like snow. After a swift glance around to see if anything lived or moved in this awful desolation, Sarka stooped and dipped up some of the fine stuff with his fingers, touched it to his lips. The material seemed to be fine blue ashes, and on his tongue it had a soapy savor. He peered at Jaska, whose eyes were glowing with excitement, whose lips were parted with anticipation, and instantly he opened a mental conversation with her. We must speak with each other telepathically, but don't speak with me until I have explained to you how to mask your thoughts from all persons save the one with whom you hold converse. First, I love you. Second, let us see if searching the sky we can find the earth. In a few brief, highly technical words, Sarka told his beloved how to talk with him in the manner which he had never before explained to her. 
They had used telepathy before, countless times, but they hadn't cared who heard. While now secrecy in all things was the prime essential for success, even for life. When he had told her, and she replied, I understand perfectly, and it seems quite easy, they turned and surveyed the heavens, out of which, by this new miracle of the secret exit dawn, they had dropped to the face of the moon. Away across the space between worlds, its transfiguration plainly visible to the two, they could make out and identify the world from which they had come. Say that they knew themselves standing on the moon, they would have thought as far as appearances went, that the place where they had come was the moon, many times enlarged. It seemed incredible that they had come so far in the twinkling of an eye, but that they had was proven by the fact of their physical presence. Look, Jaska, said Sarka suddenly, see how our earth glows, as though it were afire inside. They stared at the great circle of yellowish flame that he pointed out, and Sarka, always the scientist whose science was one of exactness, tried to estimate just where, on the Earth's surface, the glow was. Jaska, he said again, that glow comes out of the heart of the Jans area which Dalis ruled, and no one lives there, since Dalis Jans flew out to do battle. That's why we didn't know of it before we left. That glow, somehow, beloved, is the cause of the outward from the Earth journey of the Moon. First we must locate the Moon's source of the glow, and render it incapable of further forcing itself away. For do you realize that, unless we do so, we will never again see home? Jaska said nothing, but her eyes were troubled for a moment. Then she smiled again. What care if I become a prisoner of the Moon, if you are with me? Sarka was just now realizing the wonder of this raven-haired woman, whom, knowing her for half a century as he had, he had just known so little after all. "'You will seem in danger of discovery, Jaska,' he said to her. "'Drop down instantly into the ashes, for if we are discovered by dailies. He left it there, and, with a deep intake of breath, started away for the nearest and highest hill. They desired to walk, yet found walking almost impossible, as they could not keep their feet on the ground save by the exercise of a really incredible effort of will. So, despairing of keeping their feet in contact with the ashes, they flew just above them, heading for the nearest weird-looking ridge. In the strange light, which was only like moonlight in some painted desert of earth, shapes were distorted and somehow menacing, colors were raw, almost bleeding and distances that seemed but a step required hours to traverse. Ever and anon, as they traveled, they looked back up at the earth which was their home. It still was visible, though plainly smaller with the distance, and for a time Sarka's heart misgave him. But he only clasped tight in the hand of Jaska and moved on. They were just at the base of the first hill, which had now become a mountain of gloomy, forbidding aspect, when the first sound they had heard on the moon came to them, a sound that was a commingling of the laughter of dailies, the barking of jackals of the olden times, the humming of a million barrels revolving at top speed, and a stride and buzzing such as neither had ever heard. Had they been discovered? Was the sound a warning? They couldn't know, but as they stared at the crest of the hill, Two long, snaky, waving things appeared above the crest, undulating, waving to and fro, as though questing for something. They crouched low in the white ashes at the base of the mountain, and waited, scarcely breathing. End of section 9